and we took two days in Florida, which was supposed to coincide, well, an evening plus the following two days, supposed to uh, coincide with one of the launches uh, of the uh, SpaceX, but it was postponed, so we missed out on that. But I gather from Paul that's not unique. He's been there quite a couple of times and has never managed to get it to, to coincide with uh, a launch. Anyway, I thought, sorry? Yeah, well, that's true, yeah. Uh, we took hundreds of photos, and it was a major problem to decide uh, how to cut this down. Also, since it's not a full talk, only about 20 minutes or so. So this is very much the highlights of the highlights. But definitely go, and you need a minimum of three days to see it properly. Two days, you can see most of it, but I would say three days. So this is just on the way in, going through this very quickly. Myself and my significant other, as we say, Angela. And uh, she, she used to say, when you've seen one rocket, you've seen them all. She's now changed her mind. So this is what you see as you go in the so-called rocket garden of all the early rockets that they, they used, the Atlas, the Merc Mercury, Redstone, the Jupiter, and all the rest of it. Haven't time to go through them all, but that's a, a pretty nice welcoming sight as you go in. And they're, they're all, as far as I know, original unused rockets, obviously unused, because at that stage they didn't bring them back down again. But they, they're not sort of balsa wood or, or plastic reproductions, they're the actual thing. Uh, one of the biggest ones that they have is the, the Titan, and in the background you can see there, where did I put my pointer, is the uh, Saturn 1B, which was basically a sort of a, a smaller version, part thereof, if you like, of the, uh, of the Saturn V. And when you see it, you think, that's absolutely a gigantic. And there you see it again, actually, beside this. I've forgotten what that engine is, and I can't read that, but again, that's part of the Saturn 1B in the background. It, it's not fair to say that this is a site for, for boys who like sort of boys and their toys, big heavy machinery and all the rest of it. There's an awful lot of the human element in it too. But if you are impressed by heavy engineering, definitely the stuff there that will blow your mind. That's just a model to show you the relative sizes of the Saturn V and the Saturn 1B and then the various others, the Jupiter C, the Redstone, uh, Juno and whatever. Just don't have time to go into all the details of that. Some of those used for just launching satellites and others for the, the early part of the uh, manned space program, uh, Mercury and so on. Uh, just to give you a rough idea, that is all the size of the actual module of the uh, Apollo. That's what the three astronauts actually uh, came back to Earth in after their, their trip to the moon. Not big at all. And you'll see some of the latest ones now for future programs are a bit bigger. This is one of the most amazing things. I knew all the statistics about this when I went there because, as I say, I followed the, the space program right from... Uh, from the Sputnik 1 launch in Mount Graham, of course. Um, that's what they call the Vehicle Assembly Building, where they built the Saturn V and then wheeled it out on a huge launcher uh, to take it to the launch pad. And to give you some idea of the size of that building, at the time it was the biggest single building in the world. The blue part of the flag there is bigger than the tennis court. And the buses that we toured on could quite easily drive up the stripes of the flag there. You don't get close to it. You can see it from miles and miles and miles away. And it was so big that it actually uh, it formed its own weather systems inside in certain conditions. Cloud used to form inside it because of the, the sheer volume. This is the actual uh, control room for Apollo 8. Now, I have a video which gives a reproduction of the actual film of all the launch of Apollo 8 there. Uh, but it was just too big a file to put in. Uh, along with everything else, so and it would take a couple of minutes to run, so I'll skip that. But you go in there, and you see there the actual control room, and, and you see all the videos, which is very impressive. This is the actual Saturn V, and it doesn't look all that big there until you realize that these folks here are in the foreground, and what you really want to do is compare it with the size of somebody that's standing directly underneath it. And you go into that room, and as I say, I knew all the statistics, and you look at that and you think, how the flippin' heck did that thing ever get off the ground? It is just absolutely, unbelievably ginormous. Sorry for all the technical language. And that's looking along the side, and again, just to give you a size of the scale, 
there's somebody standing sort of underneath it, so they're the same distance away from it as, as the, uh, the spacecraft itself. Go with the people in the, uh, in the background, and then it disappears away off down into the distance. You can only get to that by going on a special bus tour, and uh, you get a couple of hours there basically if you, if you go reasonably early. And then they have the, the mission patches of all the Apollo flights running down alongside of there, as you can see. That's the second stage, which is uh, impressive enough in itself, but it's nowhere near as big and excuse me, as powerful as the first stage. Just skimming through the famous space pen, which they spent, I don't know, was it a million dollars or something developing because it went right upside down and in zero gravity and all the rest of it. Uh, the Russians had a much lower tech solution. They used a pencil, which went right upside down or whatever. But it shows you that they, they didn't, they were very, very limited computing powers, I'm sure you know. They actually did calculations and working out star sightings uh, and so on along the way. And they could have flown the whole mission uh, by themselves without the computer if they'd had to. So these guys are, are ones that you, uh, sort of you don't, you don't uh, dismiss lightly. This is bringing us slightly more up to date with the uh, shuttle. Obviously, the, uh, the shuttle is not attached there, but you'll see that in a moment. But this is genuine. Uh, the main fuel tank and the two solid rocket bo uh, boosters that were never <coughs> actually used, obviously. And again, to give you some idea of the size, go and look at Angela in the foreground. Look at somebody that's a bit further away, and actually she's closer to us than those rockets. Again, the size is just mind-boggling. And you walk, well, you don't have to walk onto that, but that's the approach to the building, which is all focused on the, uh, the shuttle. And there is, inside the building, the actual Atlantis shuttle. It's tilted over at an angle of about 36 degrees, so what you can see inside it, inside the cargo bay, which we look at at a moment. And you can also walk underneath and uh, see all the, the famous or infamous uh, heat resistant tiles on the bottom. And it's very hard to get far enough back to get everything in. But again, that's most of the actual Atlantis with the famous Canada arm, which they use for grabbing uh, satellites and uh, taking them out of the bay or retrieving something and putting it, putting it into the bay and so on. And again, this is, this is the actual spacecraft itself. So it was quite amazing to see that. And that's from underneath. It was very, very hard to get illumination, as you can imagine, because it's, what, 126 feet long or something or other. Uh, the interesting thing about it, every individual tile, and I mean every one underneath the shuttle, is unique. Each one is made specifically to an exact size, and they all have to be fitted in in exactly the right place. Uh, so a major thing. They also have a full-scale mock-up of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's impossible, at least in the area where the public have access to it, it's impossible to get a photograph of the whole thing. But uh, you, you get a rough idea of, of what it's like there. So that's quite interesting from the astronomical point of view. The actual bus that the all astronauts all got into to go from uh, their uh, morning breakfast and briefing, final briefing, out to the, uh, the launch pad. You're not allowed in it, as you can imagine. And uh, one of the highlights was lunch with Al Warden of Apollo 15. You pay extra for that, by the way. I'll not tell you how much. Well, you can ask me afterwards. Uh, but it's not free. But it is quite sort of a, a unique event to have, have lunch with an actual Apollo astronaut. You don't know in advance. Well, they put it this way. We had booked for lunch with an astronaut. And at the time, it was to be one of the shuttle astronauts. But Somewhere between me making the booking and uh, actually arriving there, it changed over to Al Warden, which was <laughs> rather good that it was the other way around. We didn't know that in advance, unfortunately, because it turned out afterwards that Angela's birthday is exactly the same day as Al Warden. So if we were able to say that with him, we might have been able to get an extra autograph or an extra photograph or something or other. But anyway, uh, oh, right, have I missed something out? Right, maybe there's something out of order there. Anyway, you get a lunch with them, along with a whole lot of other people, obviously, uh, and uh, you ask questions afterwards, and uh, then you line up for a photo photograph with them and so on. But 
He, he gives you quite a nice personal account of uh, his story, mainly the Apollo thing, but also his previous flights and so on. And uh, without even being asked, he volunteers the answer to what's it like going to the loo in space. And uh, in deference to the sort of the people in the audience, I'm not going to tell you the details of some of the things he says, but it's, it's not just as simple as they say, well, they have a little bag. Anyway, every single astronaut, American astronaut, that is, is in a new hall of fame. And you could spend hours there if you're interested in uh, sort of the leading figures, if you like. And that's typical of the sort of information that they have on all of them. And Neil Armstrong needs nothing further said from me. All right, here we go. Lunch with an astronaut. So uh, that was uh, quite a, an interesting occasion, as I say. You're, it's not a one-to-one. -one, uh, but there he is talking uh, about, the, about the flight. And uh, very, very interesting. As I say, unless you know in advance who's going to be talking and time your visit to coincide with, say, you want to go for an Apollo astronaut, it's just a matter of luck who's going to be talking on the day. And we were very lucky that he replaced. It was um, an American guy, but with a, a Polish name. I forget who it was that we were supposed to be with originally. So there is the actual proof. You get to meet him and shake hands with... Uh, an actual Apollo astronaut. He didn't walk on the moon. He was the, uh, the command module pilot, but nevertheless, a very important part of history. And very briefly, looking forward to the future, that is the new Orion command module, uh, which is sort of the equivalent of uh, Apollo. It won't be doing exactly the same thing, but it is much, much bigger, uh, as you can see there from, from scale. Uh, compared with the previous one. They have uh, examples of all the independent um, people like uh, Jeff Bezos and, and um, oh, what's the other one? Uh, Orion, SpaceX and so on. Uh, all and some uh, spacecraft that have actually flown and come back down again. Just don't have time to go into all the details of it. So that's the last one. Uh, as I say, thoroughly, thoroughly uh, worth uh, a visit. There's all sorts of interactive stuff. There's uh, exhibitions. There's uh, stuff for young people. There's, uh, uh, you can sort of sign up for a Mars adventure. There's a shuttle launch reproduction experience. All sorts of stuff which literally uh, I don't have time to go into. But uh, thoroughly recommend it. And as I say, allow about two or three days for, for a proper visit. So that's it. Thanks very much.